Hello, everybody. We're here from the Groundwater Project, and we have the pleasure to introduce you to our very new book. It's another great book. You'll love it. I like it. It's very interesting in the way it is presented. It's Hydrogeology and Mineral Resource Development by Leslie Smith. Leslie is an emeritus professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada. His most recent research focus has been on hydrogeological issues associated with management of mining waste rock. Earlier in his career, he investigated various aspects of groundwater surface water interaction, groundwater in near shore coastal settings, geothermal systems and contaminant transport in heterogeneous porous media and fractured bedrock systems. Well, a lot of things, very good. You get a lot of information because Les is a very experienced guy, He's seasoned in mining information, you'll love it. Okay, Les, thank you very much for, for participating in our groundwater project. It's an honor having you here. Please, your book presents a very good view of hydrogeology in the mining industry, which reflects your career, of course. Please tell us a little bit about your career for someone who doesn't know you, what you've been doing, you know how you arrived to the mining industry and how you've been a success there. Uh, okay, I uh, have an undergraduate degree in geology uh, from the University of Alberta, where I uh, was my first course in hydrogeology was with Frank Schwartz. And then uh, in uh, mid seventies, I went to the University of British Columbia, where I did my PhD with Al Fries. After that, I uh, went to uh, University of Utah for several years and then came back to Canada and spent the bulk of my university career, I think 35 years, I was a professor in the Department of Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences at uh, UBC. I retired from there about uh, five years ago. And uh, since that time, I've been uh, working as an independent consultant on uh, uh, technical review boards for mining companies, both in Canada and internationally. Oh, very good, very good. Well, uh, your book starts with climate and ge geologic settings. How important is climate? Well, we're talking a lot about climate in these days, right? How important is climate for that matter, for hydrogeology and mining industry? Climate's key because uh, one of the general rules in, in mining is that uh, water is almost as important as the ore that they're mining. So water availability, management of water is uh, a key part of the activities a mine has to, uh, mining operator has to look after. And mines occur in all kinds of uh, climatic settings. Uh, they occur in uh, Canadian Arctic down to the Amazon basin. They occur at the high elevations in the Andes and uh, islands in the South Pacific. So there's a essentially the broadest range of climate we have on the planet is what uh, uh, the mining companies need to uh, operate in or operate in. And uh, that determines temperatures, precipitation, seasonal distribution of precipitation, determines the amount of evaporation. All of those factors go into determine groundwater recharge. And as you know, groundwater recharge determines depths to water tables which has implications of if you're excavating below the water table, you're gonna have fluid inflows. Uh, they determine uh, uh, water balance, whether you have an excess of water uh, to manage at your site or you have a deficit of water. In other words, evaporation is greater than precipitation. If you have a deficit of water, then you have to find the water from elsewhere, either, either surface water or many mining companies use groundwater resources to provide a supply of water to their processing facilities. So climate sets water availability and the general framework, general hydrologic framework in which uh, they occur. In, uh, if you're in the Canadian Arctic, the groundwater problem is set by the permafrost distribution, for example, another example of how uh, the climate determines what the hydrologic system is at a uh, mine site. Okay. For, for someone who doesn't know exactly, for someone who's from Brazil, yeah. who have a very faint idea of a, what a permafrost is. Could you explain better that for us, please? Uh, okay, in, uh, in Northern Canada, there is a zone of called continuous permafrost uh, at one of the sites where I've worked there. The water, if you like, the groundwater is frozen down to a depth of 250, 300 meters. So the recharge system, 
systems there occur from lake to lake to lake because there's an unfrozen zone beneath the lake. Then between the lakes, the groundwater doesn't move because it's held up, bound up in ice. So it has a, a major impact on the character of flow systems in comparison to a, a normal system we'd experience, a uh, system that we normally encounter in sort of the Canadian prairies or the US Midwest. Yes. Where topography <laughs> controls the flow. You know, because uh, uh, I first, I first saw real snow for sure, you know, in Canada <laughs> when I was, you know, after my my graduation, you know, that, that was after my master. So yeah. that's typical for a Brazilian and for lots of people living, you know, <laughs> the equator down. That's very well, typical. My related story to that, this is a side comment, is uh, we have a, a, a dog uh, from Mexico and it was six years old when it came here. And of course, it had its first snow experience, and it's a husky. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I can I can I can understand how you probably have felt when you uh, first saw snow. <laughs> Our dog didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, but I, I, I got used to it. I lived for five years in Canada, so I I, I got used to it. I know the problems, and I know the beauty. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, you're talking about the, the, the climate, but what about the geologic setting as well? Because it's also related to, to hydrogeology, right? Can you tell exactly. us? Exactly. So just like climate uh, uh, is, has a very broad range, mines occur in a very broad range of geologic settings. They can occur in shield areas, as in Brazil or in Canada or, or Africa. They can occur in sedimentary basins. So you can deal with igneous rock, metamorphic rock, sedimentary rock. In the Andes, everything is, is a combination in the sense that you have uh, the igneous bodies coming up, forming the ore deposit, but they intrude through thick limestone beds. So you're dealing with issues of karst, for example. And, and my experience is that uh, when uh, operations don't go according to plan, it is often the case that they there was some feature in the geology that wasn't uh, anticipated ahead of time. So you have excess water inflows. So really to understand the water inflow potential uh, along fault zones, for example, through karst features, you really need to understand the geology as well. You can't do the geology, you can't do hydrogeology on uh, mine, mining projects without understanding both the water and the rock. And interaction between both, right? And the interactions between them. Yeah, very good, very good. So when devising an investigation for a mining development, how is hydrogeology important and how is it used for that? When What's you're uh, doing a, a site investigation, you have to uh, think about, for example, uh, if it's an open pit mine, you have to anticipate how much water may be flowing into the open pit mine as it's being developed, as it goes deeper and deeper below the water table. And so you need to characterize the hydrogeology in the area of the open pit or in the underground workings. If you have uh, uh, a high permeability bedrock in the area, for example, you, and you have high rainfall, you can anticipate larger inflows. So you have to have a means of uh, managing that, what volume of waters need to be managed. And so for that, you have to have a site investigation program. For a tailings facility, uh, there are foundation conditions. The strength of the foundation depends upon pore pressures in the bedrock. Uh, and so you need to uh, have a characterization program to find uh, the most suitable location for a tailings facility so that is is safe and uh, uh, doesn't require a lot of mitigation measures to make it safe. I think that, yeah, that's it for that, I think. Right, all right. So, but but then, well, let's say, okay, we, we, we go there, we have, we have a very good understanding because we 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 have the characterization of the of the you know uh, the the mine itself the whole thing the project and then you start the operations of the of the mine when you start working with groundwater at that point and how does it develop during the operations what what is necessary uh, well as my experience is that. Uh, there's as much, if not more, effort put into trying to understand the groundwater system before you develop the mine, because it's part of the mineral economics. How much money do you have to spend to manage the uh, mine environment? And then usually once you're into operations, it's things might not have quite evolved the way you had anticipated. 
And so you do investigations to try and figure out why are we having more inflow in this area than another area? So you have to mount another site investigation program there. It's often the case that uh, mines are developed in stages so that you might have an initial phase one, uh, do the exploration for hydrologic setting for phase one. And then uh, if the uh, mine is economic, they might have an expanded phase, find more ore. And so there's another round of site investigation that uh, uh, goes on with uh, uh, that activity. And then there's just the general monitoring of pore pressures around the open pit, monitoring of uh, pore pressures and, and solute concentrations in the regions around a tailings facility or a waste rock facility to make sure that uh, you're meeting requirements for environmental compliance. Okay, so okay but new site about... investigations and also monitoring. Monitoring is uh, key to making sure that uh, things are going as you anticipated. Yeah, but, but you, you use the groundwater in the production as well, right? In, in, a, in a, uh, uh, preparing, separating the, the, the ore, right? That's right, that's right. Yeah, my earlier comment, you, the water is just as important or almost as important as the ore, because if you don't have the water, you can't process the ore. Exactly, exactly. And, yeah, and so it's, it's not uh, discussed much in the uh, book. Actually, I should mention this, there are, are two topics that are obviously missing from the book, but just in terms of the scope in which I was set. One is the uh, uh, water supply development uh, for a, uh, uh, a mine site. Uh, that's aquifer hydraulics, et cetera. So that's covered in other books. Other books, yes. And, yes. and the other uh, side that is not discussed is equally important to the physical side of mining and hydrogeology, and that's the geochemistry, which is acid rock drainage processes. And I'm, I'm assuming someone else We'll eventually oh, be writing a topic on that. Yes, we're um, working on that already. Yes, yeah. but 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 you 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 presented something you know uh, for a hydraulic test there in your book with the equation that, that was quite interesting yeah. that I used. Right? Can you talk about that? I, I put the equations in, not very many of them, because uh, uh, of the the message I was trying to get across, but principally in terms of illustrating concepts such as the, the equations we use to calculate solute loads to receiving waters from a groundwater system, or the equation that uh, uh, you would use to predict when you might observe an impact of dewatering at an open pit mine on neighboring wells in the vicinity. So there are a few equations in the uh, textbook. Uh, there are also references in the textbook that would send you to other books that have much more extensive compilations of equations used to predict uh, drawdown due to excavations, drawdown due to uh, underground tunnels. But again, this wasn't a nomogram uh, I was preparing. It was a, a textbook type material. So there's a few equations to, uh, for pedagogic purposes. Uh, and the others are, you find them in the references that I incorporated in the book. Yeah, look, no, I know because I've seen, I've been to one coal mine, you know, uh, in, in, in Germany. That was closed, I don't know, 50 years ago, and you know the, the water table takes so long to recover that then yes. flooded basements and things because people didn't even know, you know, what was the original water yeah. table uh, 200 years ago or something like that. Right? So well, there, is, book. there is the example that I I, I mentioned briefly is that uh, if you're mining groundwater in an arid region. Uh, it may take the water table centuries to recover. Yep. So you may also, you may be thinking of yourself as mining both ore and water. The water is renewable, but it's renewable on a time scale of centuries. The ore is not renewable, of course, unless there's a new intrusion coming in, but uh, uh, recoveries can take a long time. Yes, yes. This is quite, quite important for someone new in the field to know that we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, a, a very long time, right? It's, it's for, you know, for some other generation to see the results after it's closed, right? Yeah, and the same would apply to uh, some tailings facilities. The tailings yep. facilities contain uh, the uh, uh, rock from which the, uh, the, the ground up rock from which the ore has been extracted, uh, usually deposited in a slurry, and it can take decades or more for the elevated water table in the tailings facility to drain down to uh, uh, a new equilibrium condition uh, in the uh, closure landscape. So uh, 
after mine closure, it can be decades or more uh, that uh, it could take for the tailings to drain. Yes. Well, that was my my next question because you talked about you talked about the tailings. You talked a lot about tailings in your book. It was very interesting some of the aspects because. I work with mine tailings, but usually as a, a, a remediation consultant that I am, uh, you arrive when, when the, the things is, is already done, right? Yeah. And in your book, you show how, how you build it and how water is important. Can, can you tell us a little bit uh, the evolution of the, of the tailings pond and how, you know, the difference that we have, because you mentioned that on your book. Could you uh, briefly tell us about that? Well, uh, Tailings ponds uh, will invert, will will have a, a tailings dam, so they have to build a, a, a tailings dam. Usually, it's built in uh, stages through the life of the mine, so it's raised every year or every two years to meet the required storage uh, uh, that is needed by the production from the, the mill. Uh, so it's not like a hydroelectric dam, which gets built in one stage. Your dam tailings dams are raised uh, uh, in lifts occurring every year and. Uh, you need to understand your volume of tailings that are produced, uh, the uh, rate at which that's occurring, and uh, the rate at which you have to construct your dam. The rate at which you have constructed the dam can be sometimes limited because if you construct it more quickly, you'll generate higher pore pressures in the foundation, and higher pore pressures uh, uh, reduce the shear strength of the foundation materials. And so there's all kinds of issues you need to think about in. Uh, dam construction for a tailings facility that link to the hydrologic system as well. That's one side of it. The other side of it, as, as uh, the water level rises in the tailings pond, there's an outward hydraulic gradient, seepage to the surrounding environment. Uh, so the facilities have to be designed in a, a, mech, in a way that uh, keeps the seepage rates at a level that uh, uh, meets the attenuation capacity in the surrounding streams, or is in compliance with uh, regulatory limits on solute concentrations in nearby monitoring wells or compliance wells set by the regulatory authorities. That's very nice. So you, you talk just just to, to, to illustrate. You talk about the the, the beaches, the size the size of the beaches that are produced. How, how are the, the beaches produces? Because you know when someone think about a beach, they're thinking about you know palm trees and things like. That. <laughs> no, it's just it's just the same, but no palm trees. <laughs> so, so you have the, the typically uh, there are two ways of doing it, but the one I'll speak to here is they might be uh, discharging the tailings from the uh, crest of the dam and the water pool forms away from the dam, which is a, a safer configuration. And as you discharge the tailings, tailings have a broad ranging grain size, usually, not always, but usually they do. And uh, there will be uh, medium grain sand to silt and clay size particles. So uh, if you deposit that into a, an open area, the medium grain and sands are gonna drop out first and the finer grain material will be carried further away into the water pool. And just over time that naturally builds up a, uh, a sandy beach in front of the uh, tailings dam. So it's an it's a element of good practice to actually get a beach developed so you have the pool, water pool away from the dam. Away from the dam. And yes. So that's that's the advantage of a, a tailings beach, and we talk about they talk about tailings uh, beaches above water, tailings beaches that develop below water. But it's just the distribution of tailings within the facility, and the hydrological aspects of that is uh, if you're looking at a, a tailing facility and saying where does the leakage most likely to occur or release to the surrounding environment, it's going to be where the tailings are most permeable, because. Yeah tailings permeability determines leakage rates. And so uh, most of the leakage will be concentrated in the more permeable tailings and uh, much lower rates of leakage would be occurring in the finer tailings, which we call slimes. So that structure inside a tailings facility is we sometimes build that into the hydrogeologic models that people use to assess seepage pathways, seepage rates. So they impose a, a stratigraphy, if you like, for the tailings deposit, just like we have to analyze the stratigraphy in a uh, in a water supply problem for uh, ir irrigation or something like another example. So concepts are the same. It's just the the geometry is a bit different. 
Okay, so Bodhi, we, we end up with a, uh, well, most of the cases, a uh, highly heterogeneous distribution within the, the, the things, right? That's correct, yep. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so, an overall pattern of coarse to, coarser to mid-sized and fine-grained, but okay. within each of those packages, there'll be uh, areas where finer materials settled out, uh, coarser materials settled out, they move the discharge locations uh, around the dam, so it's not the same position every week, every month, and that leads to a, a quite a heterogeneous system of tailings. Okay, but, but uh, just, just a curiosity, you use that, you, you have that as, a, as a, a record of how it was built, or you have to, to, to drill to, to study the heterogeneities of within the tailings? Uh, you might know the general patterns, as I just described, but if you need the detail, uh, you would have to drill. Oh, okay. uh, to get that information. Drill or there's another technology which uh, cone penetrometers, uh, CPT okay. testing. So you can go out onto the tailings beach or on a barge and push a CPT probe and you yeah. can characterize the lithology that way. No, okay, okay, that's okay. So, but there, it's usually saturated. So cone penetrometer that, 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 that will do the job, I think, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, very good. Yeah, the tailings uh, usually have a uh, during the operating phase. Uh, if you go to a small tailings facility in an arid area, 10, 20 years after mining is complete, it'll be a stack of sand. The water table will be below the base of the founda foundation. So that's the, a possible yeah. closure configuration. Okay, so in, in the long run, how does the, the plume develop and, uh, and how does it, uh, how does the, the mining companies uh, d deal with that? Do they do they have to to uh, to take care, monitor the plume development, intercept it? How is it done? It depends on the jurisdiction you're in, and what the mining company agreed to uh, at the time they received their permit from the government to develop the uh, the resource and develop the mine. Uh, some mines have made the commitment to have a de minimis release to the environment which means as small as practical, you can't make it necessarily zero. So a de minimis release to the environment. And to do that, they often use uh, pump back wells. So just like at a contaminated site where you have a pump and treat system, okay. you can imagine having a, uh, a uh, pump and treat without the treat, because usually it's pump and pump back into the tailings pond uh, during operations. Enclosure, is this water usually used in the, in the process? Maybe. Yeah, that water is then reused in the process. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it is reused in the process. Enclosure, uh, when they're no longer using the water in the process, they might, you might have a pump and treat system. So enclosure, you might be pumping the water that's leaking out of the tailings facility, uh, out of the ground to a water treatment plant where it meets the standards for release. In other just jurisdictions, you may have a, uh, a certain solute concentration limit that you're allowed to have for selenium, for example, or, or sulfate. And uh, in that case, uh, you might be able to manage your obli environmental obligations through using various low permeability cutoffs, uh, barrier walls, slurry cutoff walls. So there, those are all different kinds of strategy, much like thinking about how do you control contamination at a contaminated site, yeah, those same concepts carry over to how do you ensure long-term protection in the environment uh, at a, uh, around a, a waste rock facility, uh, <clears throat> a mine site, we've talked about uh, your background at the University of Waterloo, they have a, a long history there of using reactive barriers. Uh, reactive barriers are used at mine sites. Uh, there's, there's some here in uh, Canada I'm familiar with uh, in other countries as well. So the whole range of tools we use for contaminated site management are applied one way or another in uh, uh, management of uh, uh, protection of environmental quality at a uh, mining facility. Yeah, well, for, for something with a long range, like the, the, the you know, after you close uh, the mine closure, I think that the, the, the reactive barrier makes sense, right? Because, you know, the, the, the dam is going to be is, is going to be you know leaching for so long right yeah uh, yeah you may have to replace the reactor barrier every 
X number of years. So it, it still has an obligation to go back to the site as well. Uh, where I, my experience with reactive barriers is that uh, where you don't have a lot of site infrastructure remaining, that's when reactive barriers make sense. Okay. Whereas if you're going to be at a, a closed site where they know it's for various reasons going to take 100 years to close the facility or that's the period of time that they're working to, then a, a water treatment plant because uh, you'll have people working there, you'll have power there, etc. So again, local conditions determine your strategy for, for, for plume management. Yeah, okay. So uh, the, when you talk about the mine closure, well, how important is the groundwater? Because people think most of the times when you talk about mine closure, I, I, I worked on a, on a site here in Brazil that was closed in uh, 1968, right? Uh, I was born, unfortunately, I was already born by that time. Uh, and, you know, uh, the public attorney went back there because they were worried about, you know, the actually the degradation of the area. Actually, visually, the impact is way more important than groundwater because people still don't see groundwater, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we still have a long way with, with the, the groundwater contaminated site. If you don't care, you just leave it there. So how, how important is taking care of water after the mine closer, closure? From a groundwater perspective, the, uh, the real issue is focusing on uh, after closure, what will be the groundwater recharge rate through the tailings facility or through the waste rock facility. Uh, and what solutes will be picked up as that water is infiltrating through the tailings or the waste rock. Usually enclosure is gonna be partly through the unsaturated zone, then the saturated zone. So that's where this hydrogeochemistry topic uh, comes into play, equally important for assessing what the impacts would be as, as the flow itself. But ultimately what you're trying to do again in closure is to reduce the loadings to an acceptable level to meet environmental standards. And that usually would imply in more uh, uh, humid areas where you have water surplus, you're gonna have some kind of water cover or lower permeability water cover. You'll have diversion ditches because you wanna reduce the amount of water that infiltrates through the top surface of the, the mine waste, whether it be tailings or, or waste rock. So it's, it's really a infiltration control. There are other aspects of course as well, but uh, from a groundwater perspective, it's how to reduce the loadings to the receiving environment in the closure landscape, which is reducing infiltration. Okay, Les, that was very nice talking to you. Thank uh, you. And I really enjoyed your book. I recommend to the, the readers. Could you please make your final considerations for people who wants to read the book, people who wants to take their career in that area, please. Well, yeah. I, I hope you enjoy reading the book as uh, an introduction to the field. And uh, if you get enthused on it, Again, there's some references there that take you to the, the literature for a deeper dive into the topics. And as a career, uh, water and mining, uh, mining's got a long uh, path ahead of itself as a viable industry. And so uh, you can imagine having a, a full career in uh, working in mining and hydrogeology. They're good opportunities. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed your book and I recommend to, to anyone who is looking for a nice book, a nice introduction on mining and hydrogeology. It's a great initiative. Congratulations, Les. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good chatting with you. Uh, same here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.